Good morning and good afternoon, everybody. Thank you so much for joining the webinar today. Uh, my name is Victoria Claus. I'm with the GSMA MAGRI program. So, as I said, thanks for joining the webinar, present and future of mobile technology for agricultural value-added services. Uh, I know there'll be a couple of other people joining, but um, we better get started, I think, now. So, firstly, the agenda. Um, I'll just run through a quick introduction to the GSMA MAGRI program for those of you who uh, are not familiar with our work. Um, I'll then hand over to my colleague Ashrav who will take you through some insights from AgriVAS service providers and then also to cover a document that our team has produced which uh, takes us into some detail on IVR and SMS best practices. We'll then look at a, a new approach to designing MAGRI services and then I'll um, pass over to my colleague at the GSMA, Martin Harris, to take us through some, uh, some insights from the Scaling Mobile for Development report. Just a few housekeeping notes. If you could please keep your, uh, your line on mute at all times, that would be very helpful. And if you're on Twitter, please use the hashtag MAGRI. And if you're not already following us, our um, Twitter handle is at GSMA MAGRI. So first of all, for those of you who don't know who we are, the GSMA MAGRI program was founded in around 2009, and we work together with we work with the mobile operators who are our members at the GSMA, um, together with agricultural organisations and development organisations to look at where mobile technology can really bring benefits to the agriculture sector. So there's some contact details there as well on the screen, in case you'd like to get in touch. So the work that we've done to date as the GSMA MAGRI program is under the M Pharma initiative. So this is a joint uh, partnership with the Gates Foundation and USAID. And the objective is to uh, support the launch of commercially sustainable mobile information and advisory services for smallholder farmers. So these services, which you'll hear a bit more about in a couple of minutes, are really um, services that enable farmers to access the information that they really need to improve their yields and hopefully their incomes. So the, the services cover weather information, market information, as well as agronomy and livestock tips and pests and diseases as well. So we're working with four services, one in India called M. Kisan, um, another one in Kenya called Airtel Kilimo, obviously partnered with Airtel, and just to mention that MKISAN is the service provider we're working with there is HandyGo. In Tanzania, we're working with Tigo on their service, Tigo Kalima, and in Mali, we're working with uh, Senekela, um, which is a, a service created by Orange in Mali. So just to give you a very brief introduction to um, our new phase of the M Pharma initiative, which will open next year in 2014, in Q1, so around February, we will launch a new challenge fund, which will support six new services. And these services may be agronomy and nutrition information services, they may be financial services for farmers, and they may also cover um, supply chain solutions, all of them, of course, using mobile technology. So I'd advise you to please take a look at our website, gsma.com forward slash mpharma, or please just get in contact if you have any questions about the work we've done to date and um, the new round of the M Pharma initiative. I'll now hand over to my colleague Ashraf, who will take us through the real meat of the webinar. Thanks, Ashraf. Thanks, Victoria, and hello, everyone. Thanks for joining our webinar today. My name is Mohd Ashraf Zaman and I'm the Technical Program Consultant for GSMA MAGRI team. Over the past 18 months, I've been providing technical support to the four projects that Victoria just mentioned. When it comes to technology, the, the M Pharma services are using a combination of SMS, USSD, IVR and call centers for their customers to access the content. It is great to see a combination of different technology being used. The services have taken a phased approach of starting with some channels such as USSD and SMS. 
and then adding more channels as they go along. Today, we have two representatives from the M-Farmer projects, Yaya Najore from Chigo, Tanzania, and Sudan Jain from Handigo, India. I'd like to ask Sudanshu if he can share some insights from MKSAN service. Sudanshu, can you please tell us briefly what technologies are you using for MKSAN and what is working well and what needs improvement? I think Sudanshu might just be having an issue with his audio, so maybe we can start with Yaya. All right, okay. Uh, Yaya, I mean, I'd like okay. to ask you the same question, like what are the technologies you were using for Tigo Kilimo, what is going well and what needs improvement? Okay, thank you, thank you Ashraf, hello everyone. Um, so, um, in terms of uh, in terms of technology, uh, if I just focus on the on the user interface, uh, we're using a combination of USSD SMS and an IVR. So maybe it makes sense to explain a little bit why uh, we we're doing that. Uh, because in, in our markets, in the kind of markets we operate in, um, basically less than ten percent of the people have access to a smartphone. So again a far less like amount of people have uh, access to internet so it maintains for us to basically focus on channels that can basically uh, uh, like foster the faster take up like of the of the of the service so that's why we decided to do ussd and, 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 and sms and uh, the way the service works and has been designed at the present time uh, we basically going to use a combination of, uh, of pull model and, and push model. Uh, I mean, the push model is the model whereby the user receives the content directly without any action from the spot, and the pull model is a model uh, under which the user has to do uh, an action uh, to basically start receiving the content. And that's just for the text, uh, the text channels. We're also uh, basically in the process to uh, launch the voice channel, which is going to be the IVR channel. Again, we're doing that because of the high level of uh, illiteracy. Uh, like it's a no-brainer if you compare the two countries, uh, like Kenya and Tanzania. In Tanzania, you have a high level of illiteracy. And launching also the voice channel as part of our gender strategy to make sure that we don't exclude uh, the women uh, into into the picture and getting access to the content. So, what I can comment a little bit more uh, 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 is basically the USSD SMS, for which we have gathered enough data uh, to understand what works and what doesn't, and what needs to be improved. Uh, in, in, it just boils down to the simplicity of, uh, of, uh, of the channel. It needs to be very, very easy for people to access. Uh, it needs to be done in, uh, in a couple of steps and it needs to be basically uh, streamlined so that basically users don't have to go through so many steps in order to get the content they are looking for. So uh, that's, that's a major point that I, I would like to focus on. Uh, technology needs to serve the needs of the, of the user and not the country, uh, regardless of the, of, the, of, the, of, the, of the technology itself. It needs to be extremely, extremely easy to, to use and to manipulate from the perspective of the user. So what we guess is basically going to improve on our side is to make sure that the USSD call flow is as simple as possible and is easily understood by the final user. But based on, on the data that we have collected, uh, getting access is the first inclination of most of the user and uh, the major challenge has been for users basically to navigate through uh, USSD call flow. That's why we're working on making sure that it's streamlined and, and easy to, to navigate for the component. And as well as like, launching the push model, which will reduce the number of uh, actions that the user has to, to do in order to receive the content.
thanks Yaya for sharing that. Uh, now I want to show you some highlights of a document that we have developed uh, for those of you who are involved in mobile for agriculture or interested in doing similar initiatives through mobile channels. Uh, just to uh, mention here that if we get Sudanshu from India, maybe we can go back to him and uh, can actually ask him to share his experience, but I still can see that he is not online. So I'll go uh, with my presentation now, but maybe later on we can decide to come back to Sudanshu. So the, th the document I was referring to, so uh, as you all know that till now most of the initiatives are developed around voice and text. So in this document we try to capture almost all the possibilities through text and voice for mobile agriculture. So you can download this document from our website and the address is on the screen and, and you can get this document in the resource section. So in this document you can find different types, features and suggestions for SMS and IVA services. You can see a summary table of the content on screen. This mixture of the services are quite common in most standard IVA and SMS applications. But this can vary slightly in different countries and within different business models. So next slide please. Victoria, uh, yeah, okay, thanks. So on this slide, uh, there are some examples of the best, practice, uh, best practices that you can find in the document. For those of us who are involved in mobile agriculture, we know that we have to deal with complex content structure due to various crops, seasons, agronomical zones. So while we try to develop an IVR or SMS, it can get complicated and the farmers can find it difficult to use. Considering these challenges, the document suggests a way around where we can offer a very simple IVR menu along with direct access to the content. Another tip in the document covers how agricultural content can be distributed through SMS and IVR based uh, games, quiz and competitions. When it comes to the use of SMS for disseminating content, farmers can often make mistakes while writing an SMS to opt into a service. The document covers how, I mean, how we can actually overcome this challenge with simplifying SMS keywords and adapting common mistakes done by the users. Also another important thing is that while developing a SMS service, we often don't spend enough time thinking about the reporting and analytics. When we see our services are not doing too well and we don't have enough data to identify the reason, then we don't know how to deal with the problem. We have provided some tips on how to address this challenge of deep sorting in the document. The document also provides some suggestions if you are planning to use a service that deals with user-generated content. Uh, next slide, please. So, uh, as I've already talked about different challenges in voice and text channels around mobile agriculture, now I want to share some new thoughts for implementing mobile agriculture services. As I've already mentioned, IVR and SMS services get complicated when we have to deal with many crop types, seed types, seasons and agronomical zones. So it is really difficult to find a simple solution that can fulfill the needs of the farmers as well as the service developer. So our thinking is to develop a solution where farmers will provide demographic information only once and then the next time they access the service they just directly dial a predefined crop number 
This is possible both for UVSLT and IVR. But the dial that crop number, they just listen or get all the information, starting from agronomy tips, weather information, market price, and other necessary information without further pressing any button or further SMS or UVSLT request. So the location that the user register, the time of the year, current market price of that crop around the location will be automatically managed by the system or the platform. So user, I mean they don't have to hassle, I mean browsing to the IVR menu or USLG menu. I mean you can see the benefits of such a system on the screen. However, this idea is still in developing stage and we are hopeful it will bring another dim dimension to our services through voice and text. We are happy to share more details on this if you are interested. Now I'm going to hand over to Martin Harris, Director of Technology, Mobile for Development, GSMA, to take you through this uh, through his slides. Over to Martin now. Thank you, Ashra. Uh, as Ashra said, my name is Martin Harris. I work for the GSMA as the Director for Technology. What I'm about to take you through is a few slides um, taken from our Scaling for Mobile Development, um, which we published earlier this year. Um, this comes from uh, an accompanying slide deck of 140 slides, but you'll be glad to hear we've just chosen a few to give you an idea of, of what we were talking about. First off um, is the SMS clearly remained dominant in terms of vast services for agriculture. Um, this was taken from a snapshot um, late last year, as we, as we published earlier this year. Um, what is going on to the next, the key findings that we had from the report um, kind of slot into four main areas. One was the developing world is becoming connected at a rapid pace. That is, is fairly obvious to all of us. And it's, even with a, a slowdown later this decade, we're still looking at 10% growth since 2007 and we'll be pushing for a connected population to well over 50 percent. Next point is the network coverage is key and um, despite the rise in penetration there is still a wide gap in coverage between urban and rural areas. And the mobile penetration in ur urban areas is up to double that of rural population and also there's a, a number of reasons there which I'll come back to. Um, smartphones have grown but they're still not predominant in this market so that point is obviously relevant to this market, not to the Western markets, the developing markets. So we've seen uh, under 10% people have owned one in the developing world, um, whereas in 2007 we saw virtually none. This is dominated mostly by low-cost Android devices, um, where you've seen a gradual decline in prices to, to around 100 or sub-100 dollars. And finally is also the democratizing of data. Uh, mobile operators and internet players have um, worked together to bring data services and data plans and hybrid data plans to market so it makes it easier for users to get onto the network. Some of those implications is obviously a harness for scale. So while growth in the number of people using mobile will, um, will moderate over the next few years as I mentioned, um, we'll still expect 130 million new mobile service providers every year until 2017. Um, the other bit that's uh, not in this report but is more recently is that you will also see um, revenues from the developing world overtaking that of the developed world just by sheer dint of the, the number of users using the services. Then in terms of the, the, the network, bridging the gap is, is multi-pronged. To bridge the gap will require both further network rollout and alternative solutions such as green power and rural base stations. And obviously the network is absolutely key in terms of coverage for people to use, but it's also worth bearing in mind that we also see that people will buy mobile phones even when they don't have coverage to use them for other services like playing music and then use those services when they come to into market where the coverage is current. So it doesn't exclude people from using the service where they don't have coverage, it just means that they use it in a very different sort of way. And in terms of um, the phone side, obviously basic and feature phones are still predominant in this market. 
and it's increasingly important to con you know to consider the convergence in price and functionality between the higher end feature phones and lower end smartphones. Where you can see that particularly is things like the Nokia um, Asha series, where you've seen them develop from fairly basic feature phones into now what are, I would call low-end smartphones. Um, and there's a whole market there uh, that's coming out. Then going back to the, the data side, is there's a lot of people including these at low income that uh, will gain access to mobile data either on feature phones or smartphones. Um, one of the several ways that the operators are trying to do this, we have things like the zero rating on certain data services. And to get people started, and there are obviously uh, an access method that we potentially can use in the agricultural space. So on to the next slide, we look at um, ISMS remains dominant, but I guess you know the question is for how long. Um, SMS is the most commonly used technology for mobile enabled services. Clearly, that's because it has a huge reach. So basically, every phone that's out there. Um, can access uh, SMS. Now, it doesn't necessarily mean that it's always the best tool for the service. It very much depends on your population, as Yaya said earlier. Where you have um, a largely illiterate um, audience, then this may not always be the best tool. But it's certainly the one of the um, best in terms of reach and in terms of use of, uh, easy to roll out and, and to use. Although, you know, we do find some people have find it fairly easy to use in terms of a broadcast medium, but not always so easy to use as a, as a two-way feature. So if you want to create a service that has a to and fro with your customer, that may be a little bit more tricky. Um, it's easy to under, understand the sense SMS can only be used by a phone, which is relatively cheap to deploy. However, we believe that next um, two to three years, SMS is not really effective for literate users, as I said. Uh, Voice-based solutions have a higher upfront investment but carry longer-term benefits. What we mean by that is if you create an SMS service, you usually have a unit cost to every message you send out as a service provider. Um, now, and as you scale up with more and more users, that unit cost remains the same. It might decline slightly through volume. Um, purchases and so on. Whereas IVR is a much more upfront cost um, but has a lower per unit cost in the longer term as you drive towards volume. And going on to the next slide, you know, just to comment on smartphones, um, you know, the network coverage remains the, the driver and the limitation if you like. So most of our the, the markets we're talking about have 2G coverage to some extent. It's widespread, um, where 3G is more limited. Although we are also seeing now um, obviously the uptake of um, 4G licenses and hopefully potentially rollouts in the not too distant future. All of that again will probably be predominantly in urban areas as opposed to rural areas. However, it's important to remember that 2G can still be used for data access. Obviously, it has fairly limited bandwidth, so if you're looking at high volume urban areas, it's not anything, it's not ideal for that. But in rural areas where it's fairly low, low cost um, and low bandwidth um, in terms of the services you're providing, it's, there's still potential there for its use. Um, smartphones are the biggest data consumers, as we know, and they, but they're still owned by less than 10% of the population, and I think you'll find that on most surveys you'll find that that 10% of the population of the smartphones are skewed to the urban areas and not in the rural areas. Now we expect obviously the um, smartphone distribution to rise over time so it's going to be an interesting um, thing to watch as to see how it develops into um, developing markets and especially rural markets. I suspect the first place we'll start to see it is in what we call the agent networks. Um, these are, you know, extension workers to work for rural services, um, or you know, uh, agents for mobile networks, and so on. Uh, going to the next slide, um, what I wanted to show here is just um, again, this is obviously just one slide from 140. 
um, which you can peruse at your pleasure <laughs> if you want to. Um, but what I wanted to, to show here is basically look at the phone type at the top. And you'll see it's ranging from your feature, your basic phone to your smartphone. I think it's key here to remember that this, this is a, at the end of the day a spectrum. So you will find phones um, don't just fall neatly into all those categories, but have various channel access. And that's what we we'll try to prove down below that is the, is the various channels that you have access to and the kind of reach that they have. So obviously voice is the central part of a phone, so it's pretty much um, standard across the board. Uh, SMS and USSD, similarly, you'll find on, um, on pretty much all phones uh, these days. MMS less so, um, although it's, it's certainly useful for multimedia, but there are um, issues with not all networks supporting MMS um, and also phones having different variations of MMS. Then when you look at the sort of browsing type um, services, you've got the older phones with WAP on, uh, which is still largely supported, but has very limited uh, reach and use. And then, of course, most modern feature and smartphones will have full web web uh, support for HTML and so on, so you can create quite extensive browsing services, although you do have to remember that the design has to be specific to the small screen. And finally, we have the whole apps section. I kind of subdivided that into three areas. One is embedded apps. So these are apps that are built in by the manufacturers and, and can be even in basic phones right up to feature phones. A good example of that is, is Nokia Life Tools. Um, and then you have apps that can be downloaded, and you've, and you've got two levels of platform. One is Java, which you'll see on everything from feature phones upwards. And then you have the sort of smartphone, open OS, like Android, iOS, and so on. Obviously, the one we've included here is Android because it has the greatest spread in the markets we're talking about. And finally, at the bottom, I just wanted to put in a, um, a slight addition there, which is content value. So all these things are incredibly useful from a technology point of view. But at the end of the day, what we need to really think about is how we create that content value for the MIGRI services. And obviously, the, the type of um, content will be driven by the technologies above and the, the, the ability of the phone. So whether it's simple towards the basic end of the phone, or more sophisticated towards the end. But ultimately, what we're looking to create is value in that content for the end user. And then going on to my final slide on this section, um, what we have here is a, a, a suggested development cycle. It's come up yet. So we've got Just our, loading up, I think. OK, sorry, it's probably a big slide. Um, I'll I'll get started anyway. The, so the, I just wanted to put in there a kind of a development cycle. Um, often what we've seen is um, what we call traditional waterfall development, where you get requirements, you specify the service, you develop the service, you launch the service, and it's only at that point you begin to get a feel for whether users can actually use the service or like the service or take value service. So what we're kind of proposing at the moment is we take a more what we call iterative approach. And this, although it's a fairly complicated diagram, it actually kind of breaks down into three simple steps. Uh, the simple steps. One is concept development. So it's basically con conceiving the, the, the idea of the service and you'll be doing some low-level um, prototype designs that you can work with users. And the second part is the kind of concept realization and validation. This is an iterative cycle, where as you gradually develop the service, you're constantly testing it with the end users to find out how they use it, what they find useful, what they don't use, what, what becomes a barrier for them to use, you know, where are they dropping off in, in the, the process you're leading them through. And then the final phase is, is what I call execution and scaling. And this obviously is the, the more expensive stage, so it's only something you really want to get into once you, you're pretty confident that the, the site, the iterations you've been going through previously have developed a service that users can genuinely use and find useful to what they're doing. And then you go into this execution stage um, and various scaling. And within that, there's, there's various things. 
one of the constants in there, and you can see it very clearly, is the green line, which is content development. So that goes through this iterative cycle as you find out what content works with your uh, customer base. Um, but equally, it continues to go on throughout the whole life cycle of the, of the product. So one thing about content is it has to have a degree of usefulness and, and refresh as well as things change. Um, and I was just going to leave that there and, and go on to the next part, Victoria. Thanks very much, Martin, and thanks to Ashraf and Yaya as well. We're going to try and see if we can get Sudanshu from Handigo in. Uh, Sudanshu, is your audio working now? Yeah, I think we still still might have some issues there. Um, okay, well, let's see if we can take some questions from the audience. I had um, posted a comment to to type your questions into the, the question box or the chat box that you see on the right hand uh, panel. But I think at this stage perhaps there's a functionality where you can raise your hand. So if, if you do have a question, please raise your hand and I'll, I'll unmute your line. Hi, John. Can you hear us? If you just unmute your line, you'll be able to speak. Okay, let's try Angela Hansen. Angela, are you there? I am. Great. Hi, everyone. Uh, Angela Hansen from Dahlberg speaking. I uh, just had a question about um, any perceptions or perspectives from anyone on the call uh, about variability in terms of commodity needs uh, and the applicability of an aggregate. Do you have any perceptions on trends across different types of commodities? Ashraf or Martin? I'll probably leave that to Ashraf as he's the, uh, the angry person. Ashraf, I've just unmuted yeah, I mean, your line. Thanks. Yeah, I mean, uh, uh -huh. I'm, I'm afraid that I don't have any uh, data or example under that category till now. Okay, um, maybe just to throw out, we've done some interesting research looking at different types of commodities for accessibility for financial services, uh, and there may be some overlap there uh, as we think about the types of commodities and the types of commodity value chains that can be as best be penetrated by, by these sorts of technologies. So, very interesting space. This has been a great webinar. Thanks for hosting. Thank you so much for the question. Does anybody else have a question they'd like to raise? Okay, Charlene. If you could just introduce yourself as well, that would be great. Sure. Hi, everyone. This is Charlene Chen. I'm an independent consultant based in Nairobi. Um, I had a question. Just some, In some of my experience um, working with small-scale farmers, I found that there were a lot of great technologies and pilots of mobile agricultural value-added services. But one of the biggest challenges was um, customer adoption. So I'd love to hear from uh, the participants just what were some of the best practices in convincing farmers uh, to adopt the service in terms of um, uh, marketing and uh, customer understanding of the product? Yeah, I can answer that question. Thanks. Um, just to say, um, what in our experience, we've. Oh, sorry, there seems to be a bit of an echo there now. Oh, there we go. Um, yeah, in our experience, the the on the ground or the below the line marketing activities have had the most um, impact in getting farmers to uptake these services. So traditionally, um, mobile operators um, use SMS Plus um, to to market new products that they have, but. 
um, yeah, we've definitely found with the, the M Pharma projects that actually going out to the agricultural fairs, doing the road shows, that's where the, the greatest kind of uptake of, of new users is. I'll just unmute you if you want to. Carry on, Ashraf. Sorry. Yeah, I can add something with that because I had the experience where we structured the marketing activities for this kind of rural mobile based value as a services. So what we have seen that uh, to create a brand, a new brand, uh, the above the line activity really works well and once the brand is established and everybody knows the product then whatever we have seen is uh, working well is the field level activities as mentioned by Victoria like the fairs and face to face uh, communication where a trainer can actually show it to the people who can do it by themselves and also they can teach their friends, family members and other people who can possibly use it to get the benefit out of it. So in in, in very sh I mean if, if I want to I mean make it in very short uh, for branding and I mean and uh, creating the bars in the market uh, above the line activity works and for I mean increasing the usage and increasing the sustainability of the service below the level marketing starting from SMS blast like. Victoria mentioned and other kind of below the line activities like field level activities and fairs and other kind of face-to-face uh, -face training work very well. Thanks. Thanks Ashraf. Hello. Um, um, oh. I'd like to complete a little bit on, on this. I mean Ashraf already shared most of the points but um, basically if I, I just need to complete a little bit on this, uh, we just need to understand in which kind of markets we, we operate in and, and the market of Tanzania is basically a market where people are extremely price sensitive and one thing we may look at is basically uh, to offer a freemium um, like model just to drive the adoption of the service and this is something basically which was planned like initially and which we are seriously considering in order to make sure that uh, the, the, the service is adopted as quickly as possible uh, and is used as, as, as much as we need as well. So that's something as well that you may need to consider very seriously. Thanks very much Yaya for adding that. So we have a question from, uh, from Gideon. Abate, who is from Apposite LLC in Ethiopia. Uh, I think it's quite noisy where he is, so he's asked, posted the question in the question box. Um, what, if any, is the involvement of the private sector in the M, M Agri services that you've been involved in? So Yaya, you may want to comment on that one as well, seeing as you have been uh, talking to the private sector in Tanzania a little bit for Tigo Kilimo. I mean, just can share like very few things. Um, it's it's from our experience, it has been um, a little bit painful to engage uh, basically uh, the local stakeholders for various reasons, which are understandable uh, because they operate in a different environment and we operate in a different environment. So our basically uh, like main strategy has always been to make sure that we can share them with them I mean a list of shared benefits and that's actually what has worked quite 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 well for us in, in order to make sure that we can engage them and we can we can bring them on board but it's not um, an, an, an easy task and it's not um, uh, uh, an easy fix it's, it's a really time-consuming 
and it's, it can affect as well the, 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 the deployment uh, or the perception of the service uh, like uh, countrywide as well if, if you don't do it correctly. So it's a must, uh, it's a must because it ensures like long-term sustainability of the service uh, but that's something you may need to consider and start as, as quickly as possible in order to make sure that uh, you have enough time to engage those stakeholders. Thanks, Yaya. So we have another question that's coming from John Chieti. So my question also on adoption and uptake. Do we have figures on the number of registered or active users for Etel Kilimo M. Kisan, Tigo Kilimo and Senekela? Just trying to compare with ICAO's 45,000, M. Farms 10,000 and M. Shambas 4,000, etc. So John, thanks for the question. Um, we've, we have done some, some analysis of the four services, obviously, and I think we have uh, our latest figures show that 700, around 700,000 people have accessed the four services. So those are unique um, users. Active and regular usage is still where <clears throat> the challenge lies, and this is where the bulk of the focus of the work on these services will lie in the next, um, in the next months. So, um, the, the stage up till now has really been around launching the services, improving them, getting feedback from farmers, and now really heavy, heavy focus on <clears throat> marketing the services and driving up active uh, users. So I hope that answers your question. Uh, Charlene here has, oh thanks John, Charlene has a follow-up um, to the marketing question. Who is doing the M Pharma training? Is it marketing staff, retailers, or community members? She's just trying to understand the most cost-effective but impactful way to do below-the-line marketing. So, Charlene, I can speak um, with some experience uh, from Kenya, uh, where we're working with Airtel Kenya here, and um, I think it's a combination of all that, that you just mentioned. So, the Airtel marketing and branding teams as well as their agent networks out in, in rural areas. But also a lot of, um, one of the great benefits of these partnerships where we have agricultural organizations who are working uh, day in, day out with farmers out in the field, um, some, a lot of the marketing activities will also um, be done by, by them. So as an example, we may have marketing uh, collateral flyers, for example, that would be distributed not only by the the, the mobile operator in their um, agent network and their um, kiosks selling the airtime, for example, but also by the agriculture organizations who go out regularly, you know, and, and talk to farmers out there. Uh, does, if anybody wants to add anything else from the organizers, please, please do just jump in. Again, uh, we've just uh, seen that uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a combination of, of all those tools. We have a very unique um, like market uh, in, in Tanzania where we're using a lot of uh, outsource distribution like Salesforce to drive the penetration of the products and the services that we're selling to the people. It has proven to be uh, extremely like uh, effective and successful in, in many regards for the traditional uh, like voice and SMS services that we're selling. Uh, but you may need to consider um, an hybrid solution between um, what is currently used for traditional voice services and what can be used for uh, new solutions such as a mobile, mobile agriculture solution available on the mobile phone. So we're seriously thinking about uh, making sure that we can open new and specific channels so this leveraging on, um, on, the, on basically AgroVet's network uh, of uh, shops and, uh, and, and boutiques and make sure that we can also engage, at was, I was talking about the painful process, but you, you may need to consider engaging extension workers working for the government in order to kind of endorse the service. Um, so that's, that's the kind of hybrid solution we, we're considering in order to make sure that we can have an effective below the line strategy to drive the penetration of the user as well.
Thanks, Yaya. And thank you for the questions coming in. I think Juliana Atemi has a question here. Juliana, I'm just unmuting your line if you'd like to ask your question. Um, thank you. My name is Juliana Atemi. I work with the Kilimo Media International. We're one of the Airtel partners. Uh, I'm just curious to know um, what what is the response of the farmers? I mean, what do they say about uh, these services? Are they happy? And do they think that there is room for improvement? Um, that's my question. Thanks. Thanks, Juliana. Is your question directed to anyone in particular, or? Um, no, well, any of the three gentlemen, please. <laughs> maybe Ashraf. Ashraf, maybe you could um, you could share um, some uh, insights from uh, farmer responses. Okay, uh, thanks, Juliana. Uh, whatever we have seen uh, in our face-to-face -face discussion, that uh, uh, the services we are providing now are meeting the expectation of the farmer to some extent but still there are some uh, I mean more expectations coming in from the farmers end as well like uh, as I mentioned during my presentation that uh, the farmers really struggle to I, I mean, navigate through long IVR menu or a long USSD menu or writing difficult keywords to subscribe to the service so in most cases, they were saying that these are all good, we like it, but we want a simpler version of it. So what they mean by saying that is that they just want to talk to the extension officer kind of people. Like they want to call a number and they want to talk to a person whom they can ask the question directly instead of searching the answers by themselves. So this is the... Uh, I mean, I, I should say this is a very common challenge across all mobile for development projects. But uh, as you can understand that the volume can be so big that uh, it's really difficult sometimes to accommodate this kind of request. Like if we want to serve this to a user base of 100,000 farmers, so I have to employ something like 1,000 or maybe something like that, uh, extension workers or maybe agronomy specialist, so which is sometimes is not feasible. But obviously there are some, I mean, way around to it. So uh, to be very specific to your question, that yes, the farmers are happy to some extent, but they want more. And when I'm saying more, it means more simpler version of the service. Thank you, Ashraf, and thank you, Juliana, for the question. Great question. Uh, we have a question here uh, from Mr. Salahuddin. Uh, the question is, we are yet to see telecom operators offering commercially sustainable agri-VAS. What issues should telecom operators keep in mind to make their agri-VAS sustainable? So I don't know whether if Yaya or, or Ashraf, if you want to answer that question around sustainability of AgriVas and how operators can achieve this? I can answer. Uh, maybe Yaya and also Martin can add something afterwards. So the answer uh, to this question is something like, we don't know the exact answer yet, but what we are assuming is that we need a hybrid kind of business model here. Because this is not a music related VAT service. This is not a sports related VAT service which can actually create a very sustainable business model from the very first day. We are dealing with uh, people who are financially constrained and they are very much price sensitive and also sometimes in, in most of the countries the target audience is illiterate. So to I mean, develop something for this target segment, we have to uh, develop a, I mean, something which is very much carefully designed to capture the need of these people and also uh, according to, I mean, as I said, the very price sensitive, uh, we have to be 
very careful I mean when we're actually designing the price around these services. So I would say that we need to develop something which is in between a CSR activity and a commercial, a completely commercial valid service like music service or um, sports service. And after, I mean, after careful design, careful implementation, uh, we have to actually master this service a little bit more than other CSR activities. And I believe this will go and be a competitor to the other commercial services. And if it can compete with the other commercial services within the operative environment, then obviously this is going to be a sustainable one. And operators will be very happy to adopt in any country. So I, I, I think, uh, I mean, I, I think I can, I mean, I, I'm able to address the question that Saladin was asking. I mean, I'd add a couple of points to what Ashraf said, and that is that um, with your business, ultimately it's, it's, um, it's got to be given the low margins because of the financial constraints of the users. It's, it, you've got to develop services that scale and that have high volume to make use of those margins to make it sustainable. So uh, you know, a key point is in the development cycle I was talking about is not just developing content and product in an iterative fashion, but also your business model, because it will vary according to how you pick up users and what you do with them. And it's only that once you're happy with that, you can solidify that into business case, which you can use to execute and scale with. So I think there's still a lot of work being done with, with Ashraf and, and the and Agri team finding those models. Um, if I may like add to what the guys have already said, which is great, is basically to look at sustainability in, in, in maybe in two different ways. Um, of course, financial sustainability for mobile network operator, that's basically uh, the, one of the major points to look at and to ensure the sustainability of the service it's, itself, all right? So uh, strategic sustainability basically boils down into making sure that you engage uh, the government in, in the picture and you, you basically make sure that you have the local stakeholders who are involved into the product. I just may take the example of, of, uh, of China and Mobile, which is basically deploying such a service which is completely subsidized by the government. Uh, of course, it's not the case of Tanzania, but it's just to, to put in perspective that you need to involve the government in somehow to make sure that uh, the service is sustainable on the strategy perspective, and it's, it's part of the plan of the government to basically adopt that kind of technology to, to, to improve food security. Uh, from the, purely from a mobile network perspective, it depends how you, you package a service. Of course, uh, it's an essence industry. Uh, we're not talking about like mobile agriculture uh, just two or three years ago, right? It just like reminds me of what uh, the great story of M-Pesa or Tico Pesa looks right now. Um, Basically, it was not the case five years from now. So it's an nascent industry. Uh, so of course, it's not sustainable at the at the present time. But again, uh, you need to grow the, the the base of the customers, and it go it will go through various stages. Uh, first of all, you will need to focus on making sure that the service is a great service and is being used actually by the people. You may look at converting the service into an anti-churn and, and loyalty product where it makes financial sense for the for mobile network operator before you package the service in a, in a serious competitor with the, with the other VAS. So what I'm just trying to say is like it will need like time and it will need to go through various stages just as uh, any 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 other like nascent industry before it's financially sustainable. Uh, my my major point is uh, this looks great, but uh, we still need to do a lot of work before we can we can basically provide that kind of service and charge it fully like uh, we're doing with other like traditional vas. Thank you, yeah, yeah. Um, I think we'll just take one last question. Um, thank you to Sarif, Saif and Sari for your question. A very interesting one, actually, especially as uh, we plan to be focusing on, on this area as well in the, in the next M Pharma Challenge Fund. So the question is, can you share examples of mobile banking services being used by farmers in their agro-value chain practices or businesses? We see more peer-to-peer -peer personal transactions rather than 
them using mobile banking for their agribusiness? So I think um, it's a great question and I think from our side we see that there are starting to be more and more pilots in this area and something that we're, we're looking at closely and working with our mobile money for the unbanked team as well. Um, we've seen a couple of pilots where um, where we have agricultural organizations um, partnering with mobile operators to trial um, mobile payments, so, so turning cash payments in a closed loop value chain into mobile payments. So we've seen um, some examples of pilots in those in Africa. Um, we see that there, there is a huge potential here and it's just at, at early stage figure out, figuring out what will be the best the best model, but we're happy to, uh, to talk more about that, especially as we hopefully work with um, these six new services um, starting next year. We hope to see some, some examples of mobile, mobile banking being used in, in that manner. Right, I think with just one minute to go, I think I should just thank everybody for attending. It's been great to see so many people and, and lots of interaction with the questions as well. So thank you very much to all the attendees. And a very big thank you to Martin Harris, um, Ashraf, Yaya, and unfortunately we didn't have Sudanshu, but next time we hope that his audio will be fixed and we'll have his insights from India as well. So yeah, thank you very much everybody and um, do keep in contact. We have a number of resources on our website market entry toolkits um, and other guidelines and documents such as the one Ashraf took you through today. And uh, we'd encourage you just to get in contact if you have um, a, a service that you're developing. And um, yeah, we'd be happy to talk more. So thanks everybody again for, for joining.